Okay, everybody, welcome to session 1.4. Uh, the goals for this session are to first explain the difference between a normal corporation and a nonprofit corporation. We talked about how most nonprofits are organized as corporations, um, but there are different kinds of corporations under the law, and so we need to distinguish regular ones from nonprofit ones. I want you to be able to explain the difference between a normal trust and a charitable trust. And then we're going to go through some concepts. I want you to be able to articulate all of these. What's the corporate veil and how does it work? Corporate formalities, articles, incorporation, and bylaws. A legal doctrine called Cypre. Uh, and then each of the entity types we're going to be talking about. Corporations all the way through benefit LLCs. Okay. Let's start off by talking about corporations and how they work. Regular corporations work this way. A bunch of shareholders come together. And they pool their assets and they say, hey, let's start a corporation. And so they do so. And in the process, they appoint a board of directors. Now, this board of directors has the job of representing the shareholders in the management of the corporation. They oversee the strategy. They oversee the executive officers, people who are hired to carry out the vision of the board of directors. Executive officers are sort of like super employees. We're going to talk about them in the next class session. But uh, the basic idea is that uh, they, the executive officers work for the board of directors. And so that might be a CEO and executive director in the case of a nonprofit or someone like that. And then vice presidents and CTOs and CIOs and all those other executive level positions. They then hire employees who carry out the day-to-day -day tasks of running the corporation. Now, a nonprofit corporation is different with one key difference. There are no shareholders. Nonprofit corporations are not owned by anybody. And so th this gives us a really different structure because a board of directors runs the nonprofit corporation without having to respond to owners. Now this is for what's called a non-membership nonprofit where you have just a board of directors, but there's a special kind of nonprofit called a membership nonprofit where members have the power to appoint a board of directors. They're not owners. They don't have any stock in the, in, the, in the corporation. They don't have any rights to assets if the corporation were to dissolve. This is basically just as members, they have certain voting rights about who's on the board of directors. So you can't have what are called membership nonprofits, but most nonprofits are of the non-membership kind, which means the buck stops with the board of directors. Now, all corporations have two sets of governing rules that determine the way they operate. And those rules are called the Articles of Incorporation and then the bylaws. The Articles of Incorporation are, are filed with the state where the nonprofit is incorporated. Um, and this is actually how you create the corporation to begin with, is by filing these articles. Uh, now, the way it used to work is you'd have to actually go into a state office like um, and, and come with printed out articles of incorporation that then will be reviewed and stamped as accepted. And then that would be the birthday of your corporation when you did that. Now, the way it works is you do it all online, um, but they're still filed and made official with the state. Um, they contain certain important elements, like a purpose statement, for example, where they say, like, this is the purpose of the corporation. Most corporations today have a very vague purpose, something along the lines of the purpose of this corporation is to carry out any and all lawful activity. The articles include the name, the address of the corporation, and so forth. Um, they often have extra provisions in there. The law doesn't require these, but you can, for example, put limitations on the liability of people who are on the board of directors. So if they ever get sued, then the company will cover the cost of the lawsuit, for example. And if you're a nonprofit corporation, you have to have some special tax statements that are embedded in your articles of incorporation. And that's something we're going to talk about in unit two. But anyway, this document usually is four to five pages long and it's filed with the state agency in the in the case of Utah with the with the Department of Commerce, specifically the Division of Corporations. Now that's what's filed with the state and is on public record, but corporations also keep a set of internal rules. Uh, called bylaws. Now, these are not filed with the state unless there's some special action that requires them to be filed with the state, but by default, they don't have to be filed with the state. But even though they're not filed with the state, they still are legally enforceable, meaning that if there was a lawsuit, the bylaws could determine who the winner is. 
Um, and so these are in, an internal set of rules that are determined by the board of directors. Um, and uh, they also have to, if you're a regular corporation, they also have to be approved by the shareholders or a membership nonprofit. They have to be approved by the members. But it's really the board of directors that is guiding what's in the bylaws. And for example, you'll determine, you'll you'll describe board operations and then you'll say how often board meetings have to be, how many board members can there be, and so forth. Um, you'll describe all the executive operations. So who's the CEO? Um, what's his or her job? Uh, is there a vice president of something? What's his or her job? And so forth. And then you might define all kinds of other miscellaneous operations, like where how bank accounts have to be managed, all kinds of stuff. You really can put whatever you want in your bylaws. Um, with assignment number one, I give you some sample bylaws to look at so you can see what's in a typical set of bylaws for a nonprofit. Some other concepts that are important to understand about corporations and the way they work, perhaps the most important is the corporate veil. This has been a critical legal doctrine throughout American history because what it does is it limits the liability of the people who are helping in the corporation so that if they get sued, then most of the time the person suing has to stop just at the assets of the corporation. So let's say you were doing business with a company and they ripped you off. Um, you can sue and get access to the assets of the corporation, but you can't get get access to the assets of the typical employee at the corporation, for example. And that's because of the corporate veil. It basically creates this barrier between the shareholders' assets or the employees' assets or the board members' assets and the company's assets. And the only way you can lose the corporate veil is by failing to properly maintain it. If you mingle across the veil, for example, like if you're the owner of a corporation and you use a corporate checkbook to buy your groceries for yourself, not for the company, then you're 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 the one messing up the veil. And a court's going to say, you know what, if you're not going to respect the veil, then we don't have to either. And then if you do that, it means that if the company gets sued, it means your personal assets could also be on the hook. There are a lot of formalities that are required for maintaining a corporation. And these are requirements in the law that have to be met in order to maintain corporate status. So, for example, you have to file with the state every year. You have to make sure you hold an annual shareholders meeting if you're a regular corporation. You have to hold a board meeting at once a year, at least once a year, and that's for every corporation. If you're not maintaining these formalities, then you could have the veil pierced, or the state could just take away your corporate status entirely. And finally, it's important to understand how ownership works. In relative to corporations, basically when an entity like a corporation is owned, what it generally means is that the owners share right to its assets and its profits. Now what that means for a membership nonprofit, because the members aren't technically owners, then they don't have any right to the assets or the, or the profits of the membership nonprofit corporation. But shareholders would because they're actual owners. Okay, let's talk about trusts now. Here's how a typical trust works. You have the original owner of property, okay? Uh, let's say we're talking about me and my house. I'm the owner of my house. That makes me the settler in this situation. Let's say I want to give my house to my kids. I can do that through my will, but an easier way to do it is to do it through what's called a trust. And so what I do is I convey the house to, my, to somebody called a trustee, somebody who's going to own the house, subject to the rules that I put in place by contract. So we sign, the settler and the trustee typically sign a contract where the trustee agrees to take ownership of the house subject to the rules that I have created as the settler. And then the trustee agrees that they'll manage this property in a way that works to the benefit of my beneficiaries. And so I might, for example, name my four kids. I've got four boys and I might name them as the beneficiaries of this trust. So, so that's how a trust is created, is a settlor and a trustee engage in a contract or an agreement where the settlor gives the property to the trustee, but the trustee agrees that they have to manage the property subject to the rules that, are, that go to help these beneficiaries. A charitable trust is different, and it's different because of not this, in the case of a corporation, we swapped out the owners, here we're going to swap out the beneficiaries. And so the way a charitable trust works is for, there are two ways it can work. One is the beneficiary can be an identified 501c3 that carries out a charitable purpose. And so, for example, I could give my house to a trustee saying, I want you to use this to benefit BYU. 
BYU is recognized as a charitable entity, and so this would be a valid charitable trust. Alternatively, instead of naming a specific entity that is a charity, I could name a charitable class, a beneficiary class of people that would qualify as charitable. So I could say, for example, I want to dedicate my house to the students of BYU. BYU students would be considered a beneficiary class, a charitable class. A class has to be what's called indefinite, and that's why I use the cloud here to represent that. What that means is you cannot name specific people even if helping them would be considered charitable. I, for example, can't say I want to dedicate my house to the current students of my class. I could say I want to dedicate my house to, to the current and any future students of my class. Once I create that any future requirement, it becomes what's called indefinite. What this really means is a class of people for this test is indefinite as long as people can move in and out of the class. Homeless people, that's a charitable class. That's indefinite because people can move in and out of homelessness. Uh, BYU students, same deal. People move in and out of that status. And so that makes it indefinite enough that it's justified. What I can't do is name 10 BYU students and say I'm, I'm dedicating my house to benefit them. Once I've done that, it's no longer indefinite, which means it doesn't qualify as a charitable class. A few concepts for us to talk about. You've heard the term fiduciary duty. Um, and it generally applied to finances, but that's not the requirement. A fiduciary duty is really any time that um, someone has to put another person's interests ahead of their own. A trustee has a fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries, for example. They have to put the beneficiaries' interests ahead of their own interests. Um, the reason trusts work is because under the law we have what's called a multitude of property rights. For any given piece of property, um, there are different ways to own it. You could own the title to it. You could own the right to possess it. You could own the right to any investment proceeds that come out of it. There are all these different aspects of, of property that a person can own. And the reason trusts work is because you can sort of, it's the law, the example they always use in law school is, is like owning property is like holding onto a bundle of sticks where well, you can break apart the bundle and hand out sticks to different people. And if you do that, you're handing out different parts of ownership to the different people. Like I might give you a stick that says, hey, you can own the, you're the title owner of this. And I give another person a stick that says, hey, you get to possess the property even if you're not the title owner. And then another person in the stick that says, hey, you get any investment proceeds that result from this property, you get those. And so you can break apart ownership, and that's the way trusts work, because the trustee is the title owner of the property, but the beneficiaries are the owners of the benefits that come out of the property. The last concept to describe is called site prey. And this is where a charitable trust, the purpose of it has been frustrated after somebody has died. So I might dedicate property to BYU, for example, but then BYU might cease to exist someday in the future, heaven forbid. But if it did, well, I'm long dead. This charitable trust exists to benefit BYU. What a judge can do is step in and say, you know what? BYU doesn't exist anymore, so we're going to find another university that's enough like BYU that it will fulfill the, the original settler's intent. So whatever my purpose was when I created the trust, a court's going to look at that and say, you know what, this is a close enough approximation. If the court can't find a close enough approximation, it'll actually just dissolve the trust. And we can talk about the implications of that in class. But that's what Cypre does. It allows a judge or a court to alter a trust if the original purpose has been, has been messed up by circumstance. We're going to talk about this question in class together. Okay. Uh, there are different kinds of legal entities that nonprofits can carry out their activity through. Now, I'm going to be presenting to you some organizations that qualify, that can qualify as nonprofits, and then I'm going to show you some that don't. But the reason I'm talking about them is because they'll help us understand some organizations that can be, that are like them, that can become nonprofits. So the regular corporation, right? We've talked about this idea. Corporate, the nonprofit corporation is the most common form of nonprofit entity. Um, and in fact, a lot of nonprofits that use the title trust or association in their name are actually corporations, even though trust and associations are legally different. These are formal legal entities, meaning that they can own a property and be owned, um, that they can be sued and so forth. Um, they have very complicated formalities to maintain, like we talked about. They benefit, though, from the corporate veil, so the owners don't have to worry about their personal assets being at risk. And they can be both owned and unowned. Owned are the regular corporations. Unowned ones are the nonprofit corporations. 
The Benefit Corporation is a relatively new kind of corporation that's sort of blended between nonprofits and for profits. This is based on the basic corporate form, but what it does is it allows or requires board members to consider public benefit in their decisions. And this is based on, a, on an understanding of the law that we'll talk about in class that boards always have to benefit shareholders. That's not actually technically true, but to make sure that boards have the freedom to, to, to act in the public benefit, not just shareholder benefit, the Benefit Corporation was created. And it operates, you can set up a Benefit Corporation in about 26 states, including Utah. They're formal entities with complicated formalities. They benefit from the corporate veil. What's unique about benefit corporations is there's no such thing as a nonprofit benefit corporation. Those are just nonprofit corporations. So benefit corporations are blended, but they always are going to have owners. And if they have owners, that means they can never actually get tax exempt status. So benefit corporations work and act like nonprofits, but they're taxed like regular corporations. The association is actually the second most common form of legal entity that's used for nonprofits, but it's just not very common in Utah. They exist on the book, but almost nobody uses them. They're much more common in states like California. And these are, these are sort of like really lightweight organizations that can be used to carry out nonprofit activity. They're great for book clubs, garden groups, basically lightweight things like that. It's a way for you to get a bank account in the name of your organization, for example. They can get tax exemption, though, and it's because they are not owned under the law. So these are, though, considered informal entities. You can incorporate them, but, but they're not formal structures like nonprofits. They're really, it's just a group of people operating is what an association is considered to be under the law. They have no formalities other than saying, hey, we exist. So they're pretty simple. But there is no veil. So if you operate as an association, what that means is that um, the... Now, all the people participating in the association, their personal assets are at risk. But they're unowned. Nobody actually owns them, and for this reason, they can get tax exempt status. Talking next about trusts, um, we've sort of introduced trusts. Trusts are really great for financial planning. Like I said earlier, it's basically a contract between a settler and a trustee to help beneficiaries. Um, trusts are informal entities in the sense that they're not incorporated as like the trust doesn't own anything. It's the trustee that owns things. So it's really just a fancy contract. And so therefore it's not like a corporation. Um, but it does have complicated formalities um, because of the way trusts are taxed, because of the way trusts are taxed, because of um, the way they exist under the law, having a valid trust, you actually have to make sure you jump through the right hoops. Um, there is no veil to the trust, which means that a, a trustee as the owner of this property can have their personal assets at risk. And when we talk about ownership, they're owned in the special way that we've already addressed. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about LLCs. These can never be set up with tax exemption, and the reason is because they're always owned. But LLCs are kind of like a really lightweight corporation. Um, these have been around since the 70s. Wyoming was the first state to pass uh a law creating LLCs. Um, and so the way LLCs work is they're formal entities. The LLCs um, can uh, own a property. They can sue and be sued. But they have really simple formalities. To maintain an LLC, you basically just have to tell the state, hey, we exist. And you don't even need bylaws because the state will fill in the internal rules of an LLC if, if you don't already have your own agreement or bylaws in place to just, to say what those rules are. But here's what's cool is they benefit from the corporate veil. And this is the main reason that LLCs are really popular is because they're lightweight ways to get the benefit of the corporate veil. But they're always owned. There's no way to have an LLC that's not owned. And so for this reason, they can never get tax exempt status. I'm talking about them because there are two blended versions of LLCs that I want to address. One of them is called the L3C. It's called the L3C because there's an extra L in there. It's a low income, limited liability company. Now, you may be wondering why you'd want a low-income company. But basically, these are a way of saying, hey, we operate for a charitable purpose or of, of some kind. Um, we, But we do it at a profit where we have owners who benefit from it. So it's basically a way to carry out a charitable purpose but to benefit the owners of the LLC. Um, this was intended, this was created to simplify a tax thing called a program-related investment has to do with the way private foundations are allowed to invest their money. Uh, it hasn't worked out that way. We'll talk about it more in class. 
Um, and so for this reason, L3Cs have never become very popular. There are only you know a little over a dozen states that, that allow for L3Cs. And uh, they're nationwide, and this is as of December, nationwide there are only 1,758 L3Cs, only 92 in Utah, even though Utah was one of the first states to adopt this law. But they're just like LLCs in every other way. So they're formal entities, simple formalities, corporate veil, they're always owned. So even though these are a blended entity, they can because they have owners, they can never get tax exempt status. And then the last one I want to talk about is the benefit LLC. And this is basically an LLC that's like a benefit corporation. And so um, it's, it's basically a benefit corporation, but structured like an LLC. This is a, a relatively new, new law. There are only a handful of states that have adopted this. There's really not a legal reason to have a benefit LLC, but it has signaling value to, uh, uh, to the world, and that's why the laws have passed. I, I'm a huge skeptic of these for reasons I'll explain more in class. But anyway, benefit LLCs, formal entities, simple formalities, corporate veil, they're always owned. So even though they're blended, they're, they, they, because they have owners, they'll never get tax exempt status. So anyway, that's a quick overview of uh, session 1.4. I'll see you all in class.